Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Specifying Practice Community Group. Uh, with that, I want to hand it over to Dave and Lewis as our co-chairs to get started and introducing our guest speaker for today. Dave and Lewis, over to you. Well, thank you, Matt. This is Dave, and uh, today I am literally on the road uh, coming to you from the Garden State Parkway in New Jersey, heading back to Tuckahoe from New York City. Gorgeous day here. Lewis? I'm, I'm here in... Uh, Hermitage, Tennessee. It's a, a little drizzly today off and on, but uh, a pleasant day. And uh, Dave, why don't you introduce Mel Cowan, our f mutual friend? I'd be, ha I'd be happy to if you go to the next slide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> today, Lewis and I um, invited Mel to join us. Mel's uh, an estimator for Leopardo wow. uh, contractors in uh, based out of Chicago. And Mel is also uh, Vice President of ASPE, American Society of Professional Estimators. Uh, we, we asked Mel to uh, join us for this topic only because uh, mock-ups can have such a tremendous effect on cost and scheduling. And who better to talk about that than an estimator? So th thanks for joining us, Mel. All right. Thank All right, you. Thank you. Uh, the, okay. the motivation for this uh, program is that um, in the master specification systems, whether it's the uh, government specs uh, or master spec, uh, there are a lot of sections that have text in there for mock-ups, but folks sometimes don't realize what the implications of specifying mock-ups are. And we also want to talk about, so we want to talk about when they're really needed, when they're not needed, but also how to do it. So uh, Dave came up with this uh, wonderful idea and we'll get started. Uh, Dave, this is the influences. Uh... Yeah, so I, I did a little bit of uh, background research here just to see uh, what some of the master specification systems that we work with, uh, what they have to say about mock-ups. I was actually surprised. Uh, so UFGS, the ones that we're familiar with the military, primarily working with Specs and Tech. Remind, the folks, what UF, remind the folks what UFGS stands for. Uh, United Facility Code Specifications. So it uh, replaces the Navy, the NAVFAC, and Army Corps of Engineers. Um, NASA combines them all into a single set. So they have a, a little over 800 specification sections, and about 4% of their specs, 35 of them, uh, actually rec uh, have as part of the masters a requirement for mock-up. And one surprising thing was that only two Division Nine sections, two, two finishes, had mock-ups included, and no none of the engineering sections. So we work also with the VA, so I went to look at theirs. Now, this is VA for healthcare. They have a little over 400 specification sections, and about 32 or, say, 8% of uh, their specifications but most of those mock-ups occur in Division 9. They do have four engineering sections uh, that require mock-ups. Then, to me, the big surprise, and Lewis kept telling me that this was not much of a surprise, but <laughs> Master Spec, you know, not a little over 900 sections. Now, I, I explained 900. Those are the sections that we subscribe to, which is all of the architectural, all of the engineering, plus some communications engineering, plus historic, plus a couple of other. So it's it's more than just your basic architectural and engineering section. So it's 900 sections, and we found nearly 30%, 261, require or have included mock-up requirements. And they're pretty well distributed. They're everywhere. I found 30 in the engineering sections, and as one example, uh, I come out of an engineering sort of background working in process engineering, but I was surprised to find this in master spec. They ended up with a mock-up requirement in plumbing, HVAC, and fire protection, 
for piping insulation. So for building services, I was a bit surprised to see it if it were a process related industry, not so much because it's more per personnel protection for very high temperature services. But out of uh, master spec and for building services, a little bit of a surprise. And Lewis, well, you said this was no surprise. No, uh, that's, and that's one of the reasons why Dave and I thought this might be an interesting topic is because uh, we don't want to just willy-nilly require mock-ups because not only are they not free from the contractor, there is a cost associated, which Mel is going to help us uh, think about, and scheduling implications, but there is also a cost implication for the architect because you got to go out and look at the mock-ups and you have to process the the paperwork associated with their approval or rejection so we want to uh, try to think about when do we really need them and if we do need them how do we specify them and what should we say ready for the next slide sure all right let me get going here Okay, so what are some of the purposes for mock-ups? Well, this is my list, Lewis, and you added one item to it anyhow. Uh, but we see, we generally are seeing aesthetic mock-ups. Uh, we sometimes see mock-ups that are used to simulate the construction because it's a, some unusual condition or that it's a complicated system. And we, on a, I call it a higher, a higher design building envelope, we're likely to see a laboratory mock-up for testing, for performance testing. And the, I would say if I look at the overall, the majority is at, are absolutely design selections. And I'll, I'll ask Mel to jump in here, too, because he has to price all of these things. So, Mel, where are you seeing the bulk of mock-ups that you, you see in your construction specs? A lot of what we see in the construction, construction specs, specs and the requirements, and requirements are like, be like um, exterior wall system, 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 window system, window system, system, system. Things that you have to worry about the influence, influence of, of water, water and, and air, air, or something that might be, might a, be a, a more a complicated, more complicated out, of out of the ordinary construction. Um, Mel, do you need to turn off your uh, headset or something? Yes, we're getting a right, double. Right. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was too. I'm still I'm in. Still in. Uh, okay, we'll give you a minute to find that and get that squared away. Now, one of the yeah. uh, one of the things that I've been uh, specifying in the last few years is to the last item on the the list is to record concealed construction. Now that everybody has digital cameras or even in their phones, it's very easy. To, now to take a record so that when we're installing that first window in the wall we can uh, specify for the contractor to take photos of every step so we want to see a photo of the the rough opening that shows that the air barrier has been uh, properly linked in to turned back into the rough opening and the condition of the rough opening if there's uh, a lintel involved or anything else and then the flashing and the, uh, the actual uh, anchorage of the, of the window uh, finally the installation of the glass and then finally the installation of the sealant around the, the perimeter so that's a and then those uh, photos should be uh, kept as a record so that uh, when we're out on the job site and observing uh, the windows going in and from time to time we have some record that we we can say oh is that 
the correct sequence or doesn't the flashing is isn't it supposed to do this instead of what you've got what you're doing here that kind of thing yeah. but we had a question from uh, mary noe is that photographic documentation and yes it is but this is um, <clears throat> typically in division one we'll ask for a certain number of uh, minimum number of photographs of the overall construction progress mm -hmm. uh, on a monthly basis, but I actually um, put in with, especially the complicated mock-ups, like a window installation mm -hmm. and a wall, um, specific requirements for photos for that installation that are in addition to the general overall photographic documentation. Right. And it protects everybody. So where do we specify these? Okay, so uh, Division 1 is where we want to uh, specify mock-ups that involve multiple spec sections. Um, so for example, if we're going to do room mock-ups or an exterior wall mock-up, and we'll talk more about those kinds of things, but if it involves more than one spec section other than maybe just the application of sealants, it's probably best to put those in one of these Division One spec sections. Uh, if it's only one, you might want to stick it in the quality assurance uh, section, but if you have two or three, then you may want to write a separate field sample or mock-up spec section. Um, if it's just a, a simple individual product uh, that's fairly, uh, that relates only basically to one section other than, as I say, maybe with sealants or something, um, then that goes in part one of section format. Uh, and it can either go in the quality assurance article or again, a separate article for field samples and mock-ups because again, you might have two or three mock-ups specified in one given spec section. If you want to sit, for example, if you have multiple types of wood doors, uh, some with glazing, some without, you might want to see two or three of those doors as mock-ups. Oh, and uh, <laughs> David reminds us that the uh, terminology between whether mock-up is a hyphenated phrase or a single word is uh, not consistent even within the CSI publication. So um, pick one and, and uh, good on you. It doesn't make much difference. Uh, I prefer the hyphens, but uh, David tells me he's allergic to hyphens. I agree with you. I do not like hyphens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, David and I both kind of like the idea of specific Division I references. We don't normally like to do um, uh, just kind of miscellaneous general C Division I, but if we tell the, the contractor exactly where they are, um, and David and I both like to put it under the summary article rather than in the related requirements article, to really draw attention to the fact that there's a mock-up requirement that affects this section. You need to look at this uh, Division I section. So that's why we do that. Oops, I didn't realize that was a separate slide. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, yeah. okay. All right. So tell us about the different types of mock-ups, David. Yeah, I, I split them into these four groups, and I'm sure that everybody else has some different groups or some additional groups. But the ones that we see typically are going to be a mock-up of a particular material or a product. or And then, so that might be for something like selecting a brick, where you might just do a mock-up panel of just the brick itself to select the color of the brick and the mortar. Uh, together, you might do an assembly, which we see a lot of this with exterior walls where the architect might build this uh, modular kind of a mock-up where he can insert multiple materials. Like if you can think of like a, a 
maybe a 12 by 12 mock-up panel where he would have three foot modular inserts. He could put in brick, he could put in metal panel, terracotta, whatever it is, to try to get all of the colors, all of the materials together in the same in the same plane to make sure that they're select, making final selections that are everyone can agree on. Then we see installation mock-ups that are complete assemblies. So it would most likely going to be exterior walls. It could be some interior components that are more custom design, maybe high profile uh, lobby type spaces. Uh, could be uh, a special ceiling wall cornice detail. Could be uh, virtually anything but a, a complete installation assembly. And when, when we're looking at those, we often see those being built and documented in layers. So do the first piece, everybody agree on it, do the second part, you know, install the cladding last, but do it in, in distinct steps. And then the performance mock-up, usually uh, the ones that we see are laboratory mock-ups. We do on occasion get separate field mock-ups for performance. David, we had a couple of questions, and they are related questions. So I'm going to uh, first, Chris Birshank asks, should a mock-up always be separate from the actual installation, for example, in a warehouse? And then the related, uh, Dave Stevens has a related question, does a field sample uh, equal a mock-up? That is, are they synonymous or are they similar but different? I want to let I will Mel say answer the first one. <laughs> Ask me that question again. Um, should a mock-up always be separate from the actual installation, for example, in a warehouse? If you do a mock-up, in my opinion and what I have seen in the field, it's best to put it in the location where you're going to have the materials installed because you've got certain lighting, weather, uh, certain conditions in the field that gives it the true picture. If you're going for an aesthetic mock-up, if you're going for a performance mock-up for that particular type of assembly, that should be in a warehouse or in a testing facility. Uh, no matter what you do with that mock-up, it's gonna cost you extra money because you're out of sequence and you've gotta bring in crews to build it, submit on it, and spend the time putting the mock-up up correctly. Let me uh, address Dave Stevens' uh, question, and, and then mm -hmm. we'll kind of get back with Chris's uh, question. Um, Dave asked, are field samples and mock-ups equivalent? Are they synonymous, or are they similar but different? In the master spec uh, specifications, they never use the term field sample. I went through a phase where I preferred the, the, the phrase field sample if it was going to be like the first window installation in a building and you're actually putting it into the actual wall. But it's still a mock-up in the sense that it's a preliminary installation for <clears throat> approval of the methods and the appearance and so forth. And so... Um, I kind of like that that distinction, but it's it's not supported by master spec, and I don't know about the other spec master systems. And that deals with Chris's uh, question: is that um, in many t cases the mock-up is in fact installed as into what will be the final work and we want to specify in that case that as long as it's in good condition uh, when we uh, do the inspection for substantial completion that it can remain as part of the work and that's one of the things that needs to be specified one way or the other so that the contractor knows that uh, if I do it right yeah I don't have to do it twice or is it a throwaway that uh, we don't get paid for. 
So I right. hope that answers Chris and Dave's uh, excellent uh, and related questions. Uh, Dave Lewis asked if David asked if the slides will be available and they will be available early next week when the um, recording is posted to YouTube. Uh, Scott Anderson asks, how do you feel about may remain in place mock-ups as part of the permanent construction? And I, I believe we kind of addressed that, that that is very typical, especially for costly things like windows, where uh, again, we may want to see them put it in slowly so we can photograph where the, the, all the conditions that affect it and all the installation, um, check the anchorages and so forth. But once it's in place and we all we're all happy with it and the owner likes it, then yeah, it can stay as part of the permanent construction. Whereas there are other times when we want to see a separate one. Uh, Mary Noe says, recently I specified a field demonstration uh, during which the contractor demonstrated that it could perform the special track work installation with an available work window. Demonstration performance at the separate site short of fasteners it disassembled and then installed at the actual site. So that's an interesting variation, Mary. No. Um, oh, Dennis Burge points out that uh, that the master spec section uh, 04-2000, which is unit masonry, does in fact uh, ask for uh, both sample panels and mock-ups. Uh, yes, they don't use the term sample installation, but they do use the term sample panels, especially that's common for brick where you just lay up uh, a set of mm -hmm brick that's four by four or four by six to confirm the uh, the brick and the mortar color and maybe adjust it. Uh, let's and see. I, I'd like to suggest, Lewis, that you know, whether you're calling it a mock-up, whether you're calling it a field sample or, or not, it really becomes just semantics uh, because you're going to specify what it is that you want the contractor to accomplish, what you're asking them to demonstrate with the sample or the mock-up, and it could very well be the same. Yes, exactly. This, it's it's just uh, it's just me be, being uh, picky about words. Uh, John Arndt has a. <laughs> you've never heard to have. I know that's news to you, David, but it, it does happen. Yes, yes. Um, being consistent is probably the most important part. <laughs> John Arndt says, please comment on a requirement for a site-built mock-up required to exhibit each exterior wall construction type, including all flashing masonry ties, cavity venting, backup construction, masonry and framed, and partial wall opening, including a window corner section. All this to demonstrate and establish the minimum quality of construction and craftsmanship for the project. And yes, we'll be talking about that. Uh, we will cover that in the presentation, John. And then whom and I are in the area, uh, from the Denver area says, I use field sample for manufacturer fabricating a system, sample for visual inspection and mock-ups for assemblies and not for systems. Interesting. Okay, uh, are we ready for the next slide, David? Sure, go ahead. All right, let me get control of this thing again. There we go. So these so, the, cat the categories that David has outlined uh, are for different purposes for demonstrating. And why don't you talk us through this? And so when I was looking at the, the types of mockups, trying to at least come up with a reasonable classification, I was trying to determine why we were specifying these mockups and what we were actually expecting them to demonstrate. So when we're looking at the material mock-ups, seeing that they are of a particular material, not really any kind of a system, we're looking for the visual, the aesthetics of that particular material. For, a, for an assembly, we may be looking for integration of the materials. Remember, talking about the modular kind of an assembly mock-up, you know, 
what do the materials look at look like when they're next to each other? Are the color blends or contrasts what we're expecting? Are the are the way that the the textures coming together are those all working aesthetically? And then for the installation, ML. Shoot. Okay. For the installation, no. I think then we're looking more for the maca or the um, craftsmanship, workmanship of the installation. So if you're building a complete exterior wall assembly as a maca, you do want to be looking at the workmanship for each step of the way and I'm performance. Cool. For the uh, actual completed assembly, and the coordination so, of the of the individual material of the multiple materials that make up an exterior wall assembly. Right, all of the intersections, the uh, ter uh, terminations and connections. Yes, and the performance then for the completed assembly testing. Uh, the performance has got to be something that's tested to be able to show the uh, performance actually meets the specification. Okay. Okay. And what I'm looking at then is the purpose of these mock-ups. So I, I'm talking about type what it's intended to demonstrate, and then the final purpose. So materials are often mocked up just to confirm final selection. Did the architect make the right color selection, right texture? The assembly mock-up is there the right aesthetic coordination between multiple materials. The installation mock-up looking at transitions, how the assembly is actually put together how we terminate materials, how we join them together. And then performance is all about verifying the design. The design said we were going to get a certain performance. The test then actually verifies that the uh, design performance is met. Now, uh, I'd like to ask both you and Mel, what happens if we don't like uh, what we're seeing on any of these four categories. What happens? I get to go first. <laughs> go I get to go today. first on this. Now we we know what the what the architects will say here. So I'll speak for them. The contractor gets to do the mock up over and over and over <laughs> again until the architect likes it. Right now. Yes. Yes. Depends on how deep your pockets are. A lot of times, if the if the mock-up is built for the design and material, you know everything is per spec per drawings. You start changing around, and the guy, the contractor is going to be sitting there. Well, you're going to have to pay for this. You know, we can do another mock-up. We can do another mock-up. Just depends on how deep your pockets are. Be very oh, candid no, about it. Well, what happens? Now, what do you do? What do you do when you see the spec, though, that actually says that you're going to repeat the mock-up until it's accepted? Do you do you, well, usually, a, do you qualify your bid? We include, at least my experiences, we include the potential of a of a change up maybe twice, maybe three times at the most, and it's not like we have to totally rebuild the mock-up. We pull out a different material and put a different panel in, especially if it's an aesthetic mock-up. It's, it's okay to replace a window, a piece, or it's okay to replace some siding or stucco or brick. But if it's a performance mock-up and we have to take it down to Texas and have it tested, you know, you're talking now hundreds of thousands of dollars for that particular performance mock-up. So well, of course the it's all within reason. A performance mock-up doesn't necessarily have to be tested remotely, and um, uh, I worked on a, a project for a data center for an electronic fund transfer uh, corporation in Memphis um, 10, um, 10, 15 years ago, and 
uh, of course, the performance there was mission critical to keep out the wind and the mm -hmm. rain. So mm -hmm. we had some very large windows because of the design, and also they wanted a lot of natural light. And we put, um, we did a what I would call a field sample or mock-up of the, the first window that went in, and uh, we, you know, recorded the all of the concealed conditions and so forth. And mm -hmm. there are some simple AMA tests that you can do in uh, in place. And sure enough, we had some minor leaks. So we everybody scratched their head, and they made some adjustments to the installation techniques, retested it, it passed, and now that we were able to document what needed to be done for the installation of all the remaining windows. So, right. A lot of, a lot of the, the performance depends on what's required. Now, when I was talking $150,000 for a mock-up tested, I'm talking probably close to $8 million to $9 million curtain wall system. Yes. Well, when you have a complex system like that, you have no issue about spending this type of money because it protects <laughs> everybody. Okay. Right. If I'm um, also doing a small strip center and they wanted to do a, a mock-up, well, we put a window system in part of the building that was going to remain, and then we came out and field tested it. And it, it, it passed, so it was in good shape. So that particular type of a mock-up really didn't cost us anything because it was an integral part of the building. It, it's all in how complicated and how elaborate you want your mock-up to be depends on how much it's going to cost. And a lot of contractors that work with good specifiers and good architects understand that this is a protection for not just the contractor, it's a protection for the owner and the architect also. So there's monies that we include in our price to do all this. We just don't you know, two and three switches, you know, it, it's, we'll, we'll have to talk about it, but it's not, you know, a normal mock-up would be 10000 to $15,000. Switching out parts of the pieces would be another 5000 $6,000 to that effect. Completely rebuilding it from scratch hardly ever happens. So one of the things that we need to focus about is think about what type of mock-up are we have, what are we trying to demonstrate? What is the purpose? And then put requirements in our specification section to clarify what we're looking for and, and the purpose for the mock-up, because that can uh, greatly in, influence the, the cost and the scheduling. Lewis, you put that you hit it right on the head. That's exactly <laughs> what needs to be done right here. This is what we want for a mock-up. We want these parts, these pieces, this type, this, this, that, and the other from A to Z. Everybody understands it. It's all right there in black and white. Not only my company, but my four competitors all understand those costs are already in the budget. No, no harm, no foul. And the one question you might want to have the specifier and the architect think about is, what happens if I choose not to add the mock-up to the specification? What, what really are the implications? If the implications are severe, like a custom-designed curtain wall, that might trip the decision in favor of doing the mock-up. If the, if the consequences are pretty minor, you may want to forego the mock-up altogether. Yeah, I love well, the this. whole rule of thumb on something like this would be the more complex the system, the more likelihood a mock-up is necessary. If you're using window walls that have been used window walls as four and five hundred times over and over again, those performances of those window walls have been very well established. But if you have a curtain wall that has got a lot of panels and a lot of complexity as far as the installation, that's where you need to, my rule of thumb is the more complex the system, the more likelihood a mock-up is going to be necessary. All right. Well, let's, David, <laughs> talk, talk to us about sample panels. Well, I, we've touched on some of this already, and these, what I wanted to do is just um, show that these are the things, essentially, we've already talked about, sample panels. Let's... Put, put something together maybe to show that brick, show the range, 
of color or show the range of texture that we may get. The composite sample panels, again, to show multiple materials together and so on and so forth until we get down to the lab performance test assemblies, you know, which is the most complex and, the whole, and always the most uh, expensive to perform because mm -hmm. now you've got to have contractors, personnel traveling because uh, there are only mm -hmm. certain places where you can even do these tests. You've got to That's ship material to a site other than construction site. All kinds of logistics problems right now. That is absolutely correct. Uh, Mel, how many places yeah. around the country are there that can test, uh, say, a, c a custom curtain wall system that have the aircraft engines with the propellers to blow the, the water against the wall? I think there's about three or four. We always use a place in Dallas. Okay. And what we end up having to do with something like that is all the, mater or the materials are shipped up here. They go to the curtain wall company, they fabricate it, put it all together to make sure it fits, then they take it all apart, ship it to Texas, then they have to take the installer technicians, ship them to Texas, build the wall. Because you want the same, the same crew, basically, that's going to install the final work. Absolutely. Then the testing company has to build the structure to hold the wall there. You install the wall, they do all the testing, then we have to bust it all down and throw it in the trash. <laughs> Ship the guys home. <laughs> you know, it's, and then we start all over again. And it, it, it's, like I said, if it's like the one we just finished, the curtain wall was, you know, almost $10 million for all of it. The 150000 was, that was fine. We had no issue with spending that money because of the complexity of it. But it, it is a cost. It is an impact on the budget, especially and, anymore with tight budgets. And and there aren't many places that can do that kind of work. No, I think there's probably four that do the big walls. Okay, David, you've got a gorgeous photo here. All right. I'm guessing you're showing the photo because my internet connection is being stubborn here at the moment. Right. So it's the, the first one. Okay, so I just wanted to put in a couple of photos for anybody that may not have seen uh, a test facility. So the first one here is just showing the control panel uh, to run the um, performance test on an exterior wall assembly. It, it's not terribly sophisticated, as you can see. It's got a couple of gauges, a couple of switches, uh, the gauges to look at a pressure differential one from the outside to the inside of the test wall, uh, a gauge or a switch to turn water on and off to measure uh, the, the flow of the water against the assembly, and essentially to turn the air on and off uh, to be able to get uh, the panel pressurized. So it's not, I said, it's not terribly uh, high. It doesn't look high tech. It looks a little crude, but it's all of the uh, gauges and measurement devices that they need to make this thing work. It doesn't have to look. Doesn't have to look pretty. It just has to do the job. We had a comment from Gail Ann Goldstead that. Uh, uh, UL in Northbrook, Illinois, has a comprehensive exterior wall test facility, and uh, there's mm -hmm. another company that has one in Florida. I think the the, the one in Florida is one I've used. And um, yeah. finding the air leaks, this is a real sophisticated uh, <laughs> tool, a little uh, smoke test. And I was telling David when we were looking at this before I was doing a forensic investigation of an existing building and there were some gaps in the, in the exterior wall that I could feel cold air coming out of and so the building maintenance guy who was going around with me was smoking a cigar and so I had him hold his cigar down by that uh, sealant joint and uh, snapped a photo of the smoke being blown uh, actually it was stronger than this one <laughs> <laughs> to show that they uh, they were trying to air condition the outside of the building. And in Nashville in June, you don't want to do that. And this, this one is really to show that 
yeah, once you pressurize the wall and you recognize that it's leaking more than it should, it's really a manual search to find out where those leaks are. And this smoke stick is probably the most effective tool that you've got to, to go around the perimeter, around all the joints, uh, to try to find those leaks. Yes, the, the specific locations, yeah. Then bring on the water. There you go. Yeah. And again, so it looks really fancy, doesn't it? A little <laughs> bit of pipe, a couple of spray heads, uh, and a fire hose connected to it. So, I mean, all we're doing is trying to blast the outside of the wall. In this case, we've got a complete wall assembly. It's, a, it's an EFIS panel, steel stud back up, a couple of windows with the operating vents. Um, at the bottom, the hopper vents, and then we had some um, HVAC vents between the windows, the round objects that you see in the metal siding. So you build the complete assembly, you build the spray rack, the, the, bat, the nozzles on the spray rack are all calibrated, and turn the water on, keep the constant pressure, and check for leaks. And again, and it's really, it comes down to a visual inspection. And as Mel pointed out, uh, you also had to build the uh, something around it to keep the water, make sure the water's going on the sample and not getting just going over the top and getting behind it. Yeah. In this case, the sample was small enough that they didn't have to worry about that all that much because it was the only sample in the vicinity, too. Let's talk about room mock ups. Yeah, and we'll, we're going to let Mel talk about one that he's built recently. Uh, but the kinds of things we're seeing, hotel guest rooms, those are, for the hospitality industry, really common. Um, to, because you think about it, you're building a hotel, you might have a thousand rooms. If you get it wrong, and you get it wrong a thousand times, it's a substantial cost to fix. I was telling David last night that... that uh when I was in uh, Memphis, the firm that I worked for did a room, a hotel with 1,500 rooms, and we actually, not only did we build the mock-up, but we actually tested the mock-up for the sound transmission coefficient through the walls to make sure that uh, there was plenty of privacy between the rooms. What we have done also along the same lines is uh, the hospital work. We will mock up a complete patient room, uh, triage room, and uh, treatment rooms. And in doing this, it helps the nurses and the doctors figure out where things to be need to be for reach, height. Uh, we're doing the, uh, an emergency room where we're not really building the whole room, but we're building the cabinets out of like cardboard boxes. I was scale. just going to say. So I was just going to say that sometimes you just do that in a real simple. Uh, uh, it's yeah. not really the final materials that we're mocking up. It's we're just arranging the space with a gyp board and cardboard or whatever, so that people it's can get the yeah. for how it yeah. operates. It's total functionality of the room. Uh, the head wall was just a piece of cardboard with everything drawn on it so people can see reach. We took a warehouse and set up a almost a whole wing, but we built the walls out of Dow styrofoam sheets, the old blue board. And we made them the right thickness, and the nurses and doctors would take their gurneys through there to see how they would function, see if we needed six inches wider wall, a little bit bigger door sweep on the corners. Those type of functionality mock-ups are invaluable and they don't cost a lot of money because we're not doing, you know, the flooring and all the walls. We're just doing it for a functionality of the space. Yeah, you only do door openings and not putting the, an expensive uh, $1,000 door with $1,000 hardware in. <laughs> Absolutely. But those, and the, the the uh, end user really appreciates that type of an effort. Okay. On it, and when you have them buying in early on to confirm, 
then they're going to be happier once they move in and fortune and mm -hmm. as good fortune would have it they're not going to be happy to make changes as soon as they move in <laughs> yes. uh, absolutely yeah yes. absolutely so what's the so, impact yeah so what kinds of things do we need to consider and I've, I've segregated this list into two separate lists so uh, we've talked a little bit about the added cost and I wanted to mention the sequence disruption the multiple mobilizations cost adjustments and I put cost adjustments in only because we talked about what if in by doing the mock-up we make a decision that says we need to do something different and that something different is could be more or a higher performance or some change that results in a change of contract mm -hmm. so I, Mel, I know you, you deal with this regularly so you know what what is your biggest take on this for the um, uh, disruption the mobilizations what sort of impact are you looking at for that well Anytime you have to do a, a mock-up, you're out of sequence, which when you're out of sequence, you incur additional costs. But if you look at the additional costs versus the implication of not doing the mock-up, and then you, know, you still have to do the shop drawings for the mock-up. You still got PM time, you've got supervisor time, and, and, and all that putting that particular piece up if it can be an integral part of the building and become part of the the finished product you minimize those costs but i have i have real heartburn when i have to build a beautiful mock-up then it ends up in a dumpster at the end of the day <laughs> yes. my, my my comment is let's make it part of the, the monument sign or something you know that way we can at least recoup part of it or something but i always get shot down when i do that but there's always, anytime you do anything out of sequence, your cost goes up. For a typical example is we did a mock-up for a masonry wall. We had to pour the foundation, the block back up, the insulation, the ice and water shield, the airspace, and the face brick. Well, the mason came out and did the mock-up in about three hours. I had to pay two masons a full eight-hour day to do yeah. that. So, uh, welcome to the world of the union. But that's fine, and it helped because the colors weren't quite there. The mix was a little off, so we tweaked it a little bit with the architect, and everybody ended up being very happy with it. The normal construction, the normal part of building a building, I don't think a mock-up is necessary because we all understand. Aesthetically, it's necessary. The more complicated the wall system is, the curtain system is, I think that's where you need to concentrate on the costs because that's your most exposure on a project. Yeah, Mel Greg, you, one of uh, our audience, Greg Glacier, uh, concurs. He says mock-ups frequently used as a component of project risk management. There are costs with uh, associated with doing the completed work in an unacceptable manner. So. Mm -hmm. uh, it can save money in the long run as as well. Uh, also, yeah. Tommy Smith uh, asked, have you ever used unit prices to control costs on uh, mock-ups? Uh, no, I've not. Um, you mean have unit prices in for a mock-up in a yeah. bid document? I guess so. I think wow. that's what Tommy means. Wow. That, I've never thought about that, but you're, you, how do you how do you establish a unit cost for a hundred square feet when the when the project's a hundred thousand square feet? <laughs> we'll, we'll have to talk to Tommy separately about that. He's an old friend of mine from my Memphis yeah, well, I'd days. Love to, I'd love to talk with him because that's an interesting aspect of things. Okay. Well, and one of the hidden costs that uh, you pointed out the, the other night when we were talking about this is that um, when the uh, for an initial mock-up, the, when the trade contractors have to buy their products, they're only buying a very small quantity 
and they're not yeah. going to get it for the same good boy price that they're going to get when they buy a hundred windows to stick in the wall. They're only, <laughs> mm -hmm. and so there are a lot of uh, costs that go beyond just the normal thing. They're kind of hidden costs. There's a lot of hidden costs, you know, additional freight costs. Uh, you don't get the bulk price, but then you can negotiate a lot of that too. If a guy wants to sell me a hundred windows and he doesn't want to give me one, maybe I go to the next bidder. Yeah. See where we can go with that. Okay. And here are some of our positive things, which uh, Greg mentioned. Mm -hmm. That uh, they are a method of, of risk control for everybody and that it can help. So, uh, because if the trades are not unable you know, are having difficulties in coordinating the flashing with the air barrier with the, the exterior sealants, uh, that can be a big deal. And we need to get all that stuff worked out uh, in, in one example so that we know what we're doing for the rest of the project. Yep. I mean, just being able to confirm all of the information, all the assumptions, the fact that we can do the uh, construction and actually be able to complete it with everybody being happy. Being happy is a good goal. <laughs> satisfying, a good. <laughs> the, satisfying the owner is even a better goal. So if we can uh, make that all work by including mock-ups, I guess they have a really good purpose. So yeah. kind of the bottom line, if I can sum up, is that uh, if, if especially if we're using a standard set of specifications, whether it's the United Facilities or Master Spec or VA Specs or, or wherever, they may have some standard language in there for mock-ups and we need to think about, do we really need that? Is it important on this specific project? Is the project large enough or complex enough? Or is the uh, the thing mission critical that we need to see it, or is it something that we can just deal with in the in the normal procedure of um, construction observations as the building is being installed? So we need to exercise. Our bottom line is just because it's in master spec or whatever you don't need to include it use your professional judgment and think about whether it's important or not and whether it's worth the cost mm -hmm. right so so mel here we are top of the hour i i want to personally thank you for joining us today i i know we didn't lewis and i did not give you much notice about this and you were gracious <laughs> uh, to spend the time the time with us today so we really do appreciate it and having an in the insight from an estimator and contractor i think is really beneficial for for me and for this group uh, to be able to understand the other side of the uh, contract <laughs> well thank you i i greatly appreciate it and it's always nice to have somebody from the dark side speak up every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that very, very jokingly, because since, you know, today's May 4th. So thank you for having me, gentlemen. I, it was a pleasure. We're all in this together. Uh, next month, without a doubt. <laughs> next month, folks, uh, the first Thursday actually falls on the first of the month, and we're planning to go ahead and have our session then, which means that uh, Dave and I are going to have to get our heads together furiously to think of a new topic. So we ask that you uh, keep those cards and letters coming in, friends and neighbors, with uh, ideas because, you know, as uh, we say almost every time, we really believe that these sessions are your sessions, not ours, and uh, we're it's important to us that we uh, provide things that are of interest and use for our audience and not just uh, what we think is important. So if you've got some ideas or requests, why, let us know. And we'll look forward to yep. talking with you next month. All right. And I'm safely parked at the moment. So this is good, good place to stop. <laughs> okay, thank you all for joining us. And who knows, maybe next right. month, David will actually be in the office. Uh, uh, wishful thinking, Lewis. 
<laughs> Wishful thinking. Okay. 